Well, thank you, Kelly. It is a wonderful opportunity to be here. Uh, I got a text from my daughter in Iceland. One of her friends had sent her a copy of the poster here on campus and said, your dad's going to speak. And she's like, oh my word, dad, you're t talking to people my age. You gotta try to be inspirational and funny. So I'm really nervous because I don't know how to be both at the same time, but we're gonna try to give it a try. I am excited to talk about careers in state government. And they've asked me to first focus on mine and then to focus on yours. I hope to be able to provide uh, some practical advice. Uh, it goes by quickly. I used to come to this building all the time as an international relations major down here. And it's exciting the possibilities that are out there. And I'm hoping to share some with you that maybe you haven't thought about as you look at a career in government and as you look at different possibilities that are out there. Uh, I'm also excited that this is being recorded. How many of you have been told to record your family history or your personal history? This is, they're recording me right now. This is what that's going to count for. So I'm pretty excited. In fact, I'm doing a lot of talking about myself as I've told my kids. Just go ahead, uh, play a hymn, bring in some flowers and some potatoes, and you can use this at my funeral in a couple years. So we're excited for this opportunity to be here today and share this with you. I started out uh, by happenstance getting into this position. I'll build up to it in a little bit, but my current position in the governor's office, I serve as Governor Gary Herbert's Deputy Chief of Staff. I have been in the governor's office about 10 and a half years, and I'm in an appointed at will position. That means at any time the governor can say thanks for your service or no thanks for your service and you move on. And so it's a fairly, you know, when it comes to career stability, it's, it's a somewhat tenuous position. Most people in our office have been there about two, two and a half years, and they've gone on to other places. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, that I started with, and I'll talk about him a little more later, is Jason Chaffetz. I don't know if you've heard of Jason Chaffetz in the news. Another one that I used to work with as the Governor's General Counsel is John Pierce, who's now on the Utah Court of Appeals. Another one is Mike Lee. If some of you know Mike Lee, uh, Mike and I are very good friends in the governor's office. He's moved on to other things. So there's a high turnover, but I love the governor's office. Utah is a great state, it's very manageable, and I've worked for two terrific governors, John Huntsman, and also um, you know, for Mike Levitt prior to that on his campaign, and I work with uh, Gary Herbert. So it's been a lot of fun to work with them. But I have kind of an amorphous role in the governor's office as deputy chief of staff. Some of the things I oversee are boards and commissions. We have approximately 400 citizen boards. Everything from appointing judges, to overseeing doctors, to overseeing nurses, to uh, where do you put the hazardous waste. So we have a lot of citizen input in the state and we oversee all of those appointments that are entailed in that. We also have constituent services. We get lots and lots of phone calls, as you can imagine. On whatever the hot topic or issue of the day is, we're gonna get phone calls. And uh, I, I oversee that office as well. But a lot of what I do are other duties as assigned. And as you begin your careers, what you're gonna find is you'll have a lot of opportunities to do things that were unexpected, that were not part of uh, what you expected you were gonna do when you first uh, took the position. And they promised me this would work. Here we go. One of the first things I had to do was serve as Utah's stimulus czar. I don't know if you, how many of you remember the crash of 08? Remember economically the crash of 08? The crash hit the state of Utah, not as bad as it did other parts of the countries, but it was fast and it was severe. I remember the year before in 2007, and, and a lot of what we do in state government is provide funding. The legislature votes some money and then we oversee it. But in the legislature we had, uh, in 07, I remember Pamela Atkinson, who was a community advocate, coming up to me in the last day of the session and saying, Representative so-and-so just pulled me aside. They had an extra $100,000. They wanted to know what program to put it in. And that was after we had done a significant tax cut in the state. Utah's economy was booming in 07. By 08, things had dramatically turned around and the economy was just, it seemed like, in free fall. For those in the construction industry, uh, you know, it wasn't un unheard of to have 30 or 40 or even 50% unemployment from people who had been there. And so if you remember 08 heading into 09, you had a presidential election year, and that was the year that George Bush left office and Barack Obama, President Barack Obama took over. Part of what President Obama wanted to do was the American Recovery um, ARA Act, American Relief and Recovery Act, and, and it entailed a lot of money going back to the states. 
Now, as conservative Republicans, we were all aghast at, oh my word, you're expanding the size of government, you're gonna charge us a lot more in taxes, uh, and, and that's a bad thing. But on a practical point of view, it became, well, if we're gonna have to pay the money in taxes, well, for heaven's sakes, Utah needs to get its share back. And so what ended up happening was all of a sudden you had a multi-billion dollar stimulus package heading back to the state of Utah. And one of the duties I had, I was serving as state planning coordinator at the time, I was designated the Utah stimulus czar. It's you know about the most unpopular thing you could do as a Republican, but it was something the governor assigned me to do. And that was to oversee the collection and disbursement of $2.3 billion. And it was a real challenge. Everybody thought that if they had a shovel-ready project, there would be money. The downside is the Obama administration put on such tight strictures on how the money could be spent that it really went to advancing kind of a lot of their agenda items. That said, the money came at a crucial time, and it was something that um, significantly uh, benefited uh, the state of Utah uh, during that really tough time when we were having that tough economic uh, challenge. The next one, and I'll, um, this one is more recent, and that is, um, some of you may have followed, how many of you are from here in Utah originally? Okay, and what other states are some of you from? Just yell it out. Virginia, Virginia California, Virginia. Texas, Colorado, Michigan, Idaho, okay. Nevada. Nevada, love Nevada, a lot of great states in here. One of the big issues we had this last legislative session was religious liberties and LGBT rights. And it had been an issue that had been percolating for some time. And, and if you recall, Utah was one of the first states. We had a federal judge on a Friday afternoon in December, right before the Christmas holidays, about 2.30 in the afternoon, drop his ruling. And it was a surprise. I was sitting at my desk in the governor's office, and other people were watching the John Swallow hearing, which was taking place live on the Capitol at that time. And I just happened to see the Salt Lake Tribune and it popped up and said, Judge Shelby has ruled same-sex marriage constitutional in Utah. I literally ran down through the office to the governor's office. He was not in at the time to try to alert him. And I, and I raced across and caught the then acting Attorney General Brian Tarbett in his office and said, what are we going to do? Within 20 to 30 minutes, Salt Lake County was issuing marriage licenses. And so we tried to, to get a stop order, that was denied, and so for a long period of time, you remember the issue and the drama around the issuing of same-sex marriage licenses. And our concern as a state had been, look, marriages are fundamentally something that states have done, and this has not gone through the pro right, right process in Utah. Long story short, you know how that came down in the courts, and it became legal. But there was a real tension and a real question about the balance of religious liberties versus LGBT rights. And so Utah did something really unique, and that is we're a state that prides ourselves on compromise, on getting people around a table, on hashing out differences, and, and trying to come up with, with a good solution. And we had a lot of community partners that weighed in and said, we've got to try something successful. And so um, they spent, Senator Stewart Adams worked with a, a lot of people from the LGBT community, Senator Steve Urquhart, uh, Senator Jim DeBacchus and others worked, and Brad D, a Republican from Ogden, worked very, for a, a lot of behind the scenes work to try to craft a good compromise <clears throat> bill. The far right hated it because we were acknowledging LGBT rights, but by and large, most people thought that this was a good template. Well, one of the things I wanted to do as a, a staffer is <clears throat> how do you encapsulate this? How do you symbolize to the nation that Utah has come together on this issue? That wherever you're at in the spectrum, we've been able to reach consensus on some key points on defending religious liberties and on uh, uh, the, the solidifying of LGBT rights and state code. And so we knew the bill was coming up, and one thought that I had, I've been up at the Capitol again, you know, a decade, was the, the power of the symbol, the power of the photo, the power of the moment. And so I talked to the principal players and said, if we can get this bill passed soon enough, we could sign this on the last night of the legislative session. Now, a lot of times we'll do a bill signing ceremony and we'll do it a couple of weeks later because it takes time to print the bill and for us to review it. But I said, we've never done this before. We've never gathered everyone together on the last night of the session before it even ends and said, let's bring everyone together. 
and the parties were willing to do so. Now, the challenge was, for those of you who've been in legislative policies, you don't know until the very end if the bill's going to pass or not. There was, there was some decided opposition to this bill of folks who felt like we've gone too far one way or the other. And so uh, it, was, it was, you know, touch and go there. But towards the end, everybody coalesced around a bill. And on the last night of the session at 7 o'clock, we were able to bring Utahns together. We did something unique. On a, on a bill, there are four signatures. The president of the Senate, or wherever the bill started, the president of the Senate signs it, Speaker of the House, the governor, and the lieutenant governor attests to it. So we put up uh, chairs in front, and we brought in um, church leaders and LGBT activists and community partners, and we, we created what I thought was a powerful symbol that Utah as a state had come together on this very divisive issue. And so you can see a copy of that right there. You can see Elder Elton Perry was standing there, Pamela Atkinson, uh, Jim DeBacchus, members of Utah's LGBT community. It was one of those incredible moments in your career where you're like, you know, yes, we've accomplished some, we've accomplished some great things, and it was, it was very exciting. What we were, uh, what made us even more pleased, we were not pleased that other states had challenges, but states like Arizona and Arkansas and Indiana passed bills that didn't bring everybody together, that hadn't reached consensus. And there, if you'll remember, this was just a few months ago, there was incredible uh, disunity in their communities. There was a threat in Phoenix that they'd lose the Super Bowl and other things that were out there. And we were pleased in Utah that we were able to set a template of success and personally for me, it was, it was one of the high points of my career to be able to say, hey, let's symbolize and let's come up with something that's fun to see. Another one took place two weeks ago, and, and I'll talk about the, the value of relationships. Whatever you think of someone's lifestyle or um, the way they, they practice their religion, it's always important, and I've always tried to treat, treat, as I'm sure all of you do, people with the utmost indignity. The man there in the middle, standing between the governor and me, is Mayor Barlow of Hildale, Utah. Uh, Hildale is a sister city to Colorado City. And over the years, I've tried to establish a relationship with Mayor Barlow because he's one of the mayors. He's the duly elected representative of Hildale, Utah. I don't agree with him on uh, religious matters, obviously, but, but I have come to be uh, friends with the mayor over the years and with members of his city council. So it was... Um, it was about two weeks ago when I get a phone call from uh, or when I read on a text that they've just had this flooding in Hildell, Utah, and, and two moms and a carload of kids have just been killed, and the bodies haven't been found, and, and they were suffering from incredible flash floods in Hildell, Utah. And so because of building up relationships, I was able to immediately call the mayor and say, Mayor, on behalf of Governor Herbert, because the governor was in China at the time with our chief of staff, what can we do to help? We immediately sent our wonderful Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox down there. He drove down there to meet with the community. And I went down with uh, the governor. And it was a powerful and a moving experience to go down there and to see dozens of volunteers going along the ditch banks looking for the one lost boy that they hadn't found. And it was powerful and moving to meet with the dad and his son, who was the only survivor of that crisis, and, and to be with their family as the governor gave them some comfort and uh, support on, on behalf of the three million Utah residents that we have. And, and uh, later, uh, the state was able to come up with 1.5 million, and the, mayor w the governor flew down and spoke at a memorial service that really helped heal the rift in the community. There are solid followers of Warren Jeffs, there are apostates from that group. There are others in the community. It was nice to have an event, as, as sad as the backdrop and the premise for meeting was, that brought people together uh, in, in a way to heal, not only to show comfort to uh, the families that lost uh, loved ones there, but also to help bring the community together. One of the other things I deal with is I uh, do some community outreach. Um, Again, while the governor uh, was out of town and the lieutenant governor was out of town, the governor was now in Washington testifying, the lieutenant governor was in Richfield. So I was left at the office when we had a lot of protesters show up. Protesters were uh, concerned about Medicaid expansion and concerned about uh, the community action. They would like more money for uh, home care versus nursing home care. 
and they were very adamant about the specific proposal that they wanted to have adopted. Um, and they viewed themselves somewhat as the, the, the freedom riders in, in the civil rights era, and that they were protesting and they were not afraid to get arrested. We had um, probably 50 to 60 crowd into the foyer up at the governor's office. And everywhere I would go around the room, they would, as I would try to talk to individuals, they would block me in their wheelchairs and chant, now you know how we feel. We don't want to be in nursing homes. And, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a tense situation because you had another 50 to 60 on the outside. They were demanding to meet with the governor. The governor was out of state. The lieutenant governor was in Richfield, so he couldn't get back there. We weren't expecting them at the time, but you've had basically a shutdown of the governor's office with a lot of yelling, a lot of chanting, and security came, and I realized my first duty was to calm the situation down, that there were some in the crowd who were quite open, come and arrest us. Well, the last thing we want to do is arrest uh, people in a challenging situation. But, but what I found was helpful is I knew one person in the group, Barbara Toomer, who's a very nice lady, and I said, Barbara, what can we do? Because she says, we're not going to leave till we meet with the governor. I'm like, governor's not back in town till Monday. Uh, this isn't going to work. And so Barbara, um, we re rearranged where the governor would meet with them. In fact, we're going to meet with them tomorrow night at this time. Tomorrow night at 4.30, we're going to meet with the group. So it's one of those where there's a tense situation. Your job is to diffuse it in government. Again, it's nothing I ever planned on doing when I was a student here in international relations. But what you'll find is you have incredible opportunities in public service, you know, whether it's um, meeting uh, political leaders or impressive religious leaders. You'll also have challenging opportunities. There's nothing quite like being the only administration official at a town hall meeting where 1,500 to 2,000 people are showing up to vociferously announce that they don't want a prison in their community. Uh, you'll have a lot of those chances in public service to be the one that has to get the public input. Public has a right to petition their government for redress. Public has a right to express their positions. As poli-sci majors, as future folks who will be in political science, uh, that'll be something that you'll have a chance to uh, participate in. So in a nutshell with my, with my career, um, I started out as an undergrad in IR. And who's here in IR? Any, any what a fun degree. You know, and it was kind of ironic, though, because I went to IR because I wanted to go out and see the world and be all over the place. Well, I got a mission call to Oregon, you know, which is a great place, but it's not too international. And since then, I have lived in Rose Park up in Salt Lake. I have lived in Sandy, Utah. I have lived in Provo. I li I've lived back in Salt Lake. Then I moved to Murray, and now I live in Salt Lake again. So I have moved around a lot. But it wasn't exactly what I had envisioned when I was a student sitting in your chair a few years ago. That said, it's been an incredible opportunity. And what I hope you're open for is a lot of different ideas and a lot of possibilities about where your career could go. Because <clears throat> at the time, I remember uh, taking a couple of different classes. I remember thinking, I'm in IR. I want to be a Foreign Service career officer and, and live in Istanbul. And I took that test that the Foreign Service gives out. And, you know, it was like, know your world leaders, 95%, uh, find countries on a map, 95%. And then I failed the English portion. I'm like, how can a kid from Provo fail the English portion? Um, so I thought, well, that, that kind of shut off that career thing. <clears throat> and then I went to uh, take the test for another government agency. And uh, it was not the Secret Service, because they would leak it if I had taken and failed. But it was for another government agency, which I shall not name, because I can't remember if I signed a disclosure or not. But I drove up to Salt Lake. I went in, sat down to take the test. <clears throat> and um, the first question was like, do you, can you handle torture? No. Uh, do you like credit recognition for your work? Yes. You know, all of a sudden, as I went down and just started to take the self-evaluation questions, I realized, this is not the government agency for me. So I got up and left and uh, later studied and took the LSAT and then headed up and worked at, um, uh, you know, then, then got a law degree. Because one bit of advice I'll give you is if you're in international relations or poli-sci, now's the time to get your graduate degree. Um, you, can, you can get a job with a bachelor's degree, but it's added plus. It's very helpful to have a graduate degree. So to the extent you can get a graduate degree and get on course for that, so much the better. So, as we noted, I had started working for, I have worked for one mayor, 
two congressmen and three governors and four lieutenant governors who happen to be working for the three governors. It's been fun and it's been it's been really varied, and it's uh, been an interesting thing. But I, <clears throat> I hope you also realize there are a lot of other jobs out there <clears throat> for political science people, not just working on a campaign or working on a staff or something similar to that. We have, for example, in the state, 496 registered lobbyists. These are people who understand the governmental process, who understand the three branches of government and how a bill becomes a law, and they lend their professional expertise either to a specific company or to several companies and work as lobbyists on Capitol Hill, and they provide great insight and great information. We also have a lot of government affairs people who work uh, <clears throat> for our different state agencies. Each state agency has a public information officer. Each one of them has a legislative liaison. So there are a lot of different possibilities there that you can consider as well. So I wanted to highlight a couple of practical things from someone who, again, um, is, is whoops, learning how to work a the uh, machine here. But second, the internship. <clears throat> a lot of you will have internships coming up. I'm a big fan of internships because it was through internships that um, I got to know um, a lot of people and got exposed to a lot of different things. And it was a chance to say, oh, I'd really like to do this or heaven help me if I have to do this the rest of my career. One of the things, I, I oversee interns in the governor's office. We have quite a pool and a couple of suggestions for you in, in the office. And one is to kind of magnify your internship. Some are paid, some are unpaid. If you can get a paid one, that's terrific. If it, part of it's tuition in life, <clears throat> if you need uh, to volunteer to do an internship, for heaven's sakes, do that as well. We've had some great uh, interns. This one, uh, this intern right here was an Olympic athlete uh, at up at Utah State, came down, uh, raced, uh, uh, Connor's name, raced uh, for Ireland in the Winter Olympics. Uh, we've, we have a lot of people. We have about four or five of semester. And you've heard of magnifying your calling. I would encourage you to magnify your internship. Our director of constituent services right now has been with the governor's office about a year and a half. He started as an intern. And what ended up happening? He did such a good job that after his internship when we had an opening, we hired him on uh, to help with casework. Our constituent services person left. He had done such a good job that, that a year and a half from graduating from the University of Utah, he's now the governor's director of constituent services. He's done a great job. I take it back to when I was in Washington, D.C. I was an intern for Congressman Howard Nielsen, and you're there on the spot, and he retired, or excuse me, someone in front of me in the pecking order retired, and who do you hire? You hire people you know, or you hire people that are close in proximity, unless you've got the time to do a big, exhaustive search. The one bit of advice I would give <clears throat> to you as interns, if you're interested in government service, is the timing of your internship. If you get the chance, do the Washington, D.C. seminar your last semester of college. And that's what I did, and I'm a big fan of doing that. And the reason is, that's how I found a job. Otherwise, if you decide you love D.C., you've got the expense of moving back here, taking your last semester, and then heading back to Washington, D.C. If you're early enough in your career, I would definitely recommend that you do that. Washington, no matter what you do in government, it's always nice to say, hey, I spent a year working on the Capitol or working at the Capitol or working in Washington, D.C. But if you can do it your last semester of school, you can be back there while you're doing your internship. You can also be networking. You can be looking and finding other jobs. <clears throat> it opens up a lot of doors for you back there if you did that, and it was something that I did. So look for a chance to serve. Uh, find a project as an internship. Sam Gerkness was uh, an intern I had over the summer. Sam went through, and one of the issues that the governor's trying to promote is more gender diversity on our boards. Sam went through and counted each individual board member to find out if they were men or women. And we're making a real concerted push to get more women involved in board service. Sam took that on as a project. It's an incredible project that he did. And so uh, as an intern, realize they may not have something for you to do all the time. So if you've got some projects or some interests, do that. Or if you've got something you'd like to suggest that you do as a research policy, do that. Another great internship is the state legislative internships during the session. Those will keep you very busy. Our legislators are, are part-time legislators, full-time citizens, and they don't have a lot of staff. So if you're up there, you're the staff for a state senator or a state representative. 
you have one of the best opportunities to see the legislative process up close. And so I would strongly encourage you to also look at serving as an intern uh, in our state legislative um, process. One other comment that I'll put out there, I know you've done resumes today. We kind of like the shorter the better. Uh, make sure they pass the smell test, make sure they're punchy and fun. And the other one is social media. How many of you are on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram? Okay, so quite a few of you. Be careful what you put down. One of the first things we do is, you, how do you get to know a person? You look them up on Facebook. Uh, you, you see what their family's like, you see what their activities are like. But also be careful what you print on those things. Um, there was a friend of mine who was a student down here not too long ago who during a recent Utah Senate campaign put some very disparaging remarks about one of the candidates on his Facebook page. A couple weeks later, the candidate that he had disparaged uh, won the Republican nomination, and a couple months later, he's the U.S. Senator, and this particular individual wants to go back to Washington, D.C. He knows I'm friends with Mike Lee, and he calls me and says, hey, what can you do to help? And I'm like, they haven't kind of forgotten what you posted on your Facebook page. Oh, well, my opinion's changed. Well, I'm, I'm sure it's changed, but, you know, when they're looking to hire and they're looking to put staff in, you like to put people who are at least nice. And one of the rules I've also tried to follow in Utah is, are you familiar with the six degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon? Anyone heard of that? Explain what that is. This is the audience participation part of the program. Can anyone explain what six degrees is with Kevin Bacon? It's for extra credit, so be watching, Kelly. Ke yeah, go ahead. Amen. So you're just, everybody's just six degrees separated from Kevin Bacon. In Utah, it's about two degrees. In the LDS church, it's about three degrees. I'm always careful when I'm at a restaurant, and I, I, I try to do it when I'm talking about different people. Someone's brother-in-law, someone's home teacher, someone's sister is in the room where, where you're getting ready to tell a story. And it's a good life lesson for all of us. Just be careful what you say. Say nice things. Don't put things on your Facebook page that, that, that you're going to regret, uh, things that are going to come back and get you. So um, recognize that as, as, as you go forward with different things. Another thing to talk about is networking, and I just put this up here. Again, Mike Lee um, was a very good friend of mine when we were in the governor's office together, and uh, Mike dated my wife in college, and it was, uh, how many of you ever dated? Okay, so a few of you, so you know what that's like. Well, I remember during the campaign, I wanted to call a press conference to say that a woman who dated Mike Lee was going to tell everything. And I knew we could get the satellite trucks there. I knew we'd get a lot of attention. And what she was prepared to say is Michael Lee, Mike Lee was a perfect gentleman. And Mike is a great guy. And I put this here just because I had to uh, find a photo here. Here he was introducing me to Ted Cruz. But one of the key things you have going for you is networking. We will see dozens of resumes. And we'll often hire people, you know, we don't know. Resumes can also stand out. But it also doesn't hurt to have networking. When I was a BYU student, I went to every, just about every time there was a banner up advertising that someone was speaking on campus that was politically related, I'd go to it. Because I have always liked politics. Ever since I was a little kid, I've always enjoyed politics. And uh, I got to know a lot of people that way. One I got to know was a guy named Chuck Warren. Chuck Warren, a uh, couple years later, I've graduated from law school, I'm practicing law, and I get a phone call from Chuck Warren saying, hey, there's a guy named Chris Cannon, he's running for Congress, do you want to be his campaign manager? It came about because we had been friends and we came to events like this together at BYU and I started working um, for Chuck and for Congressman Cannon. A couple years uh, later, and I'll show you a slide and highlight this, uh, I was working for Provo City for Mayor Lewis Billings, loved Mayor Billings, loved working for Provo City, and I get a phone call from a guy I had had constitutional, or excuse me, communications law with from Professor Dallas Burnett. We sat by each other all the time. He was a Democrat, I was a Republican. Um, he came around, joined the Republican Party, and it was Jason Chaffetz. Jason and I had stayed good friends, and he said, I've run Governor Huntsman's campaign. We're putting a staff together. Would you like to be considered for a staff position? Again, it came about because networking. Jason and I were diametrically opposed politically at the time. He was running his um, half-brother's father's campaign on campus, uh, uh, Governor Mike Dukakis, 
at the time, but I'd go to his events and I'd support his events and we always were friendly and got along really well. And it, it was because of networking that I was able to secure um, the position with Congressman Cannon that got me going into some political things and also with uh, uh, Governor Huntsman. One of the other things uh, we'd encourage you to do is, and it, I don't have a, um, is volunteer. Uh, a lot of you have missions, and I'd be curious how you described your mission on your resumes. And, you know, it makes a difference if it's in-state or out-of-state, if people get it or don't get it, but I'm sure that's something that Kelly will highlight with you. But volunteer on campaigns. It's it's fun. If you're, if you're into political science, you like candidates, you like government, that's how you make an impact. You go out and you get a city councilman elected, or you vote, you know, you push for a bond issue, you get a governor elected. There are a lot of different campaigns that you can get involved with, and also get involved with the community. As I mentioned, I oversee boards and commissions. We have 400 plus boards in the state. So as you get older and in life, hey, get, in, get involved with um, the, the different uh, activities. I want to tell you about an activity we did with the BYU uh, Political Affairs Society last winter. I don't know if any of you, did any of you participate in this activity last year? Okay, a couple of you were here. So we had, um, my wife uh, Liz came up with the idea of uh, speed mentoring. So you'd had speed dating, says a lot of times you bring in somebody like me today who comes out and talks with you, but you don't get to know the person as well as you could if you sit down one-on-one -on -one across the table from each other. So we arranged for 50 people from state government. Uh, uh, we had the Attorney General, we had Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox, we had the head of major agencies, we had a dozen legislators. We had a really good political mix and we brought the students in, and here is John Dougal, a good friend of mine who serves as a former legislator, serves as a state auditor, who's one-on-one -on -one with a student. And, and, and when you have these networking opportunities, take a chance to get prepared. We had one student who sat down across from the Attorney General, uh, and most of you know the Attorney General and what the role they, they do, and she says, well, what do you do? Well, what's an Attorney General? And it was kind of one of those where it was, it was a little deflating for him that they didn't know, and it was and it was something she could have gained a bit more from if she had been a little better plugged in. I'll contrast that with what uh, J.C. Skinner, the experience she had. J.C. Skinner is a governor's general counsel, uh, Utah State graduate, and then uh, Jerry Clark Law School graduate here at the Y. And she said she sat down across from one of your peers, and she says, "Hi, I'm J.C. Skinner. I'm the governor's general counsel." And she says. Oh, I know who you are. And she proceeded to give her her resume and say, JC, you've done this and this and this. And she says, and someday I want to work for you. And JC was just blown away with this, that here was a student that, that had figured out who she was, figured out how to get positioned in the room so we, not, not everyone could visit with everyone. But it made such an impact on her that this person cared who I was, this person cares about my career and has studied up on my career. And, uh, you know, given time, I fully expect she'll find her way to the governor's office as an intern or, a, or as an employee. So we, as um, a chapter in Salt Lake, work really hard to provide opportunities. For example, on October 24th, this is a, a little plug here, October 24th, 6 o'clock at the Gilmer uh, Ward, or the Elcrest Ward on Gilmer Avenue, and we'll get you more information. We're holding a fireside with Dr. Magleby. And we've done them with different political leaders. But the, the goal, I mean, the fireside and the message the speakers give is wonderful. But our goal as people who've graduated is to try to help each of you connect with someone, to find out what do you want to do for a living? What are your interests? Who can I introduce you to? Who can I send you to lunch with so that you can further your career, whether it's at the state level, the local level, uh, back in DC? It's a great place to meet people. And then on the first Thursday after the session starts, this proved to be so successful last year, we're anxious to do it again this year. And why are we doing this? Because we want to provide, as graduates, mentoring opportunities for you. That if you're interested in a particular area, if there's someone in state government you'd like to get to know, we want to open those doors and uh, help you out. So here's the group right there. Uh, 
that put it together. And as you, as you look at the group, you'll see we have the head of the World Trade Association of Utah. We have uh, Senator Mike Lee's chief of staff, a wonderful guy named Boyd Matheson. We have just a really great mixture. We have Senator DeBacchus up there in the middle, who's an uh, active Democrat up in Salt Lake. We've got Democrats, Republicans. Our uh, co-president up there is the head of Mormon Democrats. It's very, uh, it's partisan, because that's what you do in politics, but it's very nonpartisan in its application. So we really hope you'll take advantage of that and, and come up and participate with us. I want to highlight the first job here, and I uh, have here is a picture of my daughter, Grace, and I grew up in the small town of Farron, Utah. It's about 13 to 1,400 people, depending on who's home for the weekend, south of Price, Utah. And I grew up working on a dairy farm down there, and I highlight this for the first job because I want to give you some practical advice for the next few years um, in, in your job. A, be proud of where you come from. I love my hometown of Farron. I'm proud that I used to milk cows for the lemon dairies. And uh, it's, it's fun being a father to Grace and, and the other kids. But there, there will come a time, and, and I had a good friend. Uh, I'll show you a picture later. But last weekend, a good friend of mine came who gave me some really good advice when I was your age. And he says, Mike, I want to warn you that the toughest time in life will be after you graduate from college and you're waiting for your first real job. And I didn't kind of know what he meant at the time until I graduated and you're doing jobs, but you're not, your, your career trajectory hasn't taken off in the direction that you want it to. I mean, I'd be so thrilled if 30 years ago I'd be standing up here doing the things I'm doing and working with the people I'm working. But at the time, that just wasn't uh, the case. And I think about a talk that uh, was given by Sister Neil Marriott uh, last weekend at General Conference. It will all work out. And again, I was a person who had wanted to go all over the world, and you had your mission called to Oregon, which meant you weren't going to get the language skills that you would have if you were in Taiwan or Chile. And I ended up in state government rather than federal government, but I have absolutely loved it and have really enjoyed it. So I think often of what Sister Marriott said. And that is um, to focus on that and to realize you'll get your first job. It'll take a while, but it'll all work out. And things to help make it work out are networking and staying in touch with people. And one of the big challenges is being truly excited for the success of your friends. Um, it's, it's something that's kind of tough to do sometimes. But I've learned, hey, if I can be just as excited that my dear friends now elected to the U.S. Senate and another one may be the Speaker of the House next week, we'll have to tune in and see what happens. It's a lot of fun because life's about friendships and about a lot of good things. And I want to get, I don't want to make this too much into um, a Sunday school, but I also want to say, hey, remember to focus on the family. You may be taken, uh, you know, you may head up to law school. You may head um, to a lot of different areas and different, different paths in life. And a lot of times your career will demand a lot from you. But one of the nice things about being able to come to Brigham Young University is to share you know, I talked to a lot of students, a lot of different student groups, but we share some common values and some common faith here. Um, some practical advice I want to give is to live within your means, to buy health insurance, to buy life insurance, to pay your tithing, and uh, get prepared for retirement. About 10 years ago, uh, while living here in Provo, I was, again, working for Mayor Billings, who was a, a great boss, and I was the spokesman for Provo City during the Olympics and was here for the initial revitalization of downtown. Uh, and it was a wonderful time in Provo. It's, Provo's really cool. Provo's really come into its own. That was a period of time. Mayor Billings and the council at the time really helped get that set up. But my wife was diagnosed with cancer. And um, it was a real challenge um, for a lot of different reasons. And what, what you find is most important, your careers are wonderful, but you never forget family. You never forget... Um, you know, those basic things. We had moved, she was an attorney, I was an attorney, but we felt inspired, you know, we need to move to a smaller house and pay off our debts. And we needed to do some family things. And so on the religious note of, of today's things, focus on your family. That's, you're here because you've got common values. You're here because you're surrounded by other people that are the same way. One of the things I love about working for the governors I've worked for uh, particularly Governor Levitt and certainly Governor Herbert, is the shared faith and the shared values that we don't have to work Sundays like you do in other governmental entities or in other elected offices, that there's an appreciation that if you've got a church assignment that you need to leave at 6 o'clock, 
because meeting with the, uh, the youth of your church congregation is, is every bit as important as what you're doing for the state. And so, uh, again, you're at a wonderful place at a wonderful time right now, and some great things can happen. But as you move forward in your career, there's a tendency to pour so much into your career. I'm so glad we had a balance because you just never know when, when bad things are going to happen to the family. And... Uh, Anyway, on a more positive note, I want to focus for the last few minutes on working for the state. The state of Utah, we have 24,000 employees in the state of Utah. So there are a lot of different positions and a lot of possible things to focus on in there. I have had a career where I've really been a generalist. I mean, when you're going from floods in Hilldale, Utah on one day to um, you know, dealing with uh, disability rights advocates, to dealing with public lands issues, uh, today, I was in a meeting where the big discussion was on the need for greater facilities for uh, the autopsies that we perform, for the medical examination. So I've been a real generalist. But a lot of what we do in state government is, is a lot more specific. And you can see here, we have loads of different departments. And each one of those departments need people like you and students like you with the skill set that you're developing to go and work there. So uh, administrative services oversees all of our buildings. Boards of pardons and parole, you can guess what they do. Uh, commerce oversees the regulatory structure of our state. Economic development, education, health, human services. Uh, you, you hear so much about the federal government, you see directly the impact of local government, but a lot of times people, uh, especially when you're looking at careers, don't think about the state and what the state can provide. One of the things I'd encourage you to do as you're looking for jobs is to visit this website. We're pleased in Utah that we've got a great website that you can go to that highlights uh, different jobs that are available in the state, and that's at jobs.utah.gov. And I encourage you to go there and to find out if um, there's something there that interests you and, and to work with it and to uh, see if that works out. One last pitch I'll make and then open up for questions. Oh, it's kind of fuzzy. Um, I had the opportunity to go to BYU uh, Jerusalem semester. We had the reunion at our house last week in Salt Lake. Uh, we brought along a camel because how can you do an Israel reunion without a camel? But wanted to highlight again and remind you, this is a wonderful time. This is a wonderful place. You're with people who share your values. A lot of my lifelong friends came from the poli sci department at BYU and Washington Seminar. You had similar interests. You had similar values and convictions. And throughout my career, they blessed my life. I've made a real effort to try to help them out where possible, whether it's passing along a tip for a job opening or, or putting my name down as a reference or as a resume. Another thing I'll encourage you to do, get, a prof get to know a professor. Uh, I remember going to apply for law school, and you had to have three letters of recommendations from professors. Now, the downside about a lot of our poli-sci classes here is, you know, there were 200 people in the class. I didn't get to know the professor individually. And so if I had to go back, you know, I found professors who were willing to do that. But get to know your professors, because as you apply to graduate programs, as you, as you do those other things, it'll be your professors that uh, really come through for you. And then last thing, uh, uh, after my wife passed away, again, it was networking. I was lined up on a blind date and married Liz. We now live in Salt Lake and have seven kids. If you get a chance in life, you need to go to the BYU-Notre Dame game at Notre Dame. The fans are incredibly nice. Uh, the experience was terrific. We led through halftime. Uh, so it was, it was a lot of fun. So if you can do that, that's one thing I'd encourage you to do as well. Uh, just in conclusion, as, uh, as a BYU alum, I realize, hey, who do you know? Who, who can I reach out to? Who can open some doors for me? I'll leave some cards here, and I'm very sincere when I say, if I can help you find something, if I can get you in connection with someone, add me as a Facebook friend or add me as a tweeter, Twitter thing person. Let me know who you are, and I'm, I'm happy to do that. If you're up at the Capitol, I'm happy to take you to lunch. Um, I know a lot of times people feel like you need to be politically connected. What we can do as alums is uh, are open those doors for you. So if you're trying to get on the Hill and you need an intro to uh, Congressman Bishop's office, or if, if you're applying for a job in state government, please let me know and we're happy to, to do what we can. At the end of the day, it'll be the skills that you bring to the table. It'll be the knowledge that you've acquired and the way you present yourself that'll seal the deal. 
but it doesn't hurt along the way to, to network and to reach out and to get involved and associated so that uh, you can maximize yourself and maximize your careers. And so with that, it has been a pleasure to uh, be with you here today, and I'm going to turn the time back over to Kelly. Yes. Um, I'm curious, as, as someone from out of state, when I come to Utah, I see a ton of development. Mm -hmm. I know that over the summer, you and the governor visited every county. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, do you agree on the growth of Utah and how we can accommodate the expansion? We are reaching 3 million people. We're still debating if that'll take place in November or December. And so, uh, with a lot of planning. We're anticipating that our population will double to 6 million by 2060. It's because people like me have seven children. Uh, we have large families. Uh, we love our large families, but it's, it's one of the concerns that we have in the state. But we're doing it through planning. Uh, I just came from a meeting today where we're trying to balance agriculture land and the need to maintain agricultural fields with the need for subdivisions and new homes popping up. So it's something we focus on, Envision Utah. If, if you want to see in a nutshell what the, the plan is for the state moving forward, I'd encourage you to, encourage you to, to visit the Envision Utah website because that shows you kind of the plans that we're looking at uh, moving the state forward. Greater density, uh, people riding trains, not so many people in cars, that sort of thing. Yes? Yes. Great, great groups. I started out my career um, working for the Legal Aid Society in Salt Lake. So I spent a year with them and then um, changed trajectories. Loved it. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, the, the nonprofit world is, 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 is something you need to consider in a great, again, it's, it's great. Any other questions? Uh, yes. <laughs> You know, Holy Hannah, I mean, this was such a shock. I, I, I mean, it, it's interesting in, in politics. It, uh, did any of you watch, what was the movie about the White House, the TV show every week? West Wing. West Wing. West Wing. My, it's like my job, but a heck of a lot smaller. I mean, the state plane compared to Air Force One. But it, things happen that fast. I was surprised that Speaker Boehner, who I always, you know, thought was doing a good job, whammo. You know, he resigned, and then McCarthy resigned. It shows that the Republicans... Uh, could use some unifying. I think it, it helps Jason Chaffetz. The question is, are the McCarthy loyalists going to have viewed what he did as disloyal and banned around somebody else? But I think the world of, of Congressman Chaffetz, as I said, I owe my job to him. I wouldn't be married to my wonderful wife if he hadn't hired me and I hadn't moved from Provo to Salt Lake. So, you know, I'm very, I'm very loyal to Jason Chaffetz and, and a big fan of his. So, but come up to Salt Lake. We hope to see you as governor's office interns. I'll leave some cards. Again, I'm serious. If you, if you want to know someone, if you want, uh, I'm happy to take you to lunch, happy to get to know you, happy to add you as a Facebook friend or, or whatever we can do to help out. And in the meantime, we hope to see you at our fireside and at our speed mentoring program in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone.